So we're going to get started, so we're going to post colors. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. It's a great day to be at Albany State University. Welcome to Albany State University's annual Founders Day Convocation. I'm Valerie Melton, and I'm the Vice President for Institution Advancement and the Executive Director of the Albany State University Foundation. This year marks a celebration of 121 years of academic excellence and student success on the division of our founder, Dr. Joseph Winthrop Holly. It is my pleasure to preside over the program this morning. To begin the program, we will have invocation. Please welcome to the podium, senior pastor of Second Mount Zion Baptist Church, Dr. Theodis Drake, Jr. Following the invocation, we will have a selection from the Albany Civil Rights Freedom Singers and the ASU Concert Chorale under the direction of Dr. Erica Williams. Dr. Pastor Dre. Yes. 
Let us pray. Gracious God, our Father, creator, maker, sustainer of life. Your word tells us to give honor to whom honor is due. We have come here today once again to give that honor and to reflect upon the passionate vision of Dr. Joseph, founder of this great institution. We could not measure nor appreciate the worth of this institution and the impact it has made upon thousands unless we do this. Not only have we come to honor Dr. Holly, but we have also come to honor and thank you, God, for your guiding light. For we realize as the psalmist, except the Lord build the house, the labor labors in vain. Except the Lord watches, the watchman watches in vain. 121 years ago, began this journey and you, God, have watched over it every step of the way. We thank you, God, for this time of recognition and reflection upon the life and legacy of this, your servant, Dr. Holly. We thank you for the tens of thousands of people who've been and are now a part of the journey. We thank you for the impact his vision has made on this on this country, on this city, on this state, and on the world, and on the students who have come to learn. We ask now, God, that you will continue to be the guiding light that will carry this Auburn State University through many more years of serving. The poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow said in this song of life, Lives of great men all remind us that we can make our lives some line and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Footprints that perhaps another sailing over life's solar made, a forlorn and shipwrecked brother seeing shall take heart again. Thank you for the footprints of Dr. Joseph Holly. Thank you, God, indeed. Amen. I woke up this morning with my man. My
Come on, we can do better than that. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. That was awesome. So now we'll have our occasion provided by the 81st Mrs. ASU, Jordan Elder, and the 11th Mr. ASU, Christopher Seitz. Please welcome them to the podium. Give it up one more time for the concert band. <laughs> greetings this morning. I am Christopher Sykes, your 11th Mr. Albany State University. And greetings. I am Jordan Nicole Elder, the 81st Miss Albany State University. We are here celebrating 121 years of unsinkable resilience. And today, we'll be observing the legacy of Joseph Winthrop Hawley and his predecessors as they make the remarkable accomplishments of founding this beloved institution we call Albany State University. This continues to fulfill his vision and a beacon of light and hope and perseverance in, which, in this Southwest Georgia community. Thank you. It is with great pleasure and privilege that I introduce to you a member of the Holly family. Mrs. Cheryl Willis is the great niece of Dr. Joseph W. Holly. Following her reflections, we will have another musical selection from the Albany Civil Rights Freedom Singers and the ASU Concert Chorale. So at this time, please welcome the great niece of our great founder, Mrs. Cheryl Williams. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Frederick, members of the dais, faculty, students, friends, and family members. I am Cheryl Yvette Willis, the ancestral niece of Dr. Joseph Winthrop Holly. On behalf of Josephine Holly, Jefferson, daughter of Dr. Holly, it is indeed my pleasure to greet you on this 121st Founders Day. Our family thanks and appreciates you for extending the invitation to celebrate. As we gather to commemorate Dr. Joseph Winthrop Holly, the visionary founder of Albany State University, we are enveloped in the theme of unsinkable resilience. This theme not only captures the essence of Dr. Holly's legacy, but also resonates with the powerful lyrics of the National Blank Anthem, lift every voice and sing. As well as Augusta, Georgia's native son, James Brown's empowering anthem, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. Through these musical pillars, we find a profound reflection of Dr. Holly's life and the unsinkable spirit he instilled in the foundation of ASU. The steering lyrics of lift every voice and sing, sing with a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Speak directly to the journey undertaken by Dr. Holly. His establishment of this university was a beacon of light in the dark past of segregation and disenfranchisement, offering hope and a path forward for African American students. Dr. Holly's work embodied the resilience and faith in progress that the anthem calls upon us to remember and continue. Echoing this sentiment of pride and self-determination, James Brown's Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud, serves as a powerful testament to embracing one's identity and strength found in the unity and collective resilience. Dr. Holly's mission was aligned with the message of this song, a call to stand tall, to recognize one's worth, and to work tirelessly for the advancement of our community. We've been buked and we've been scorned. We've been treated bad, talked about as just as sure as you're born, but just as sure as, as it takes two eyes to, to make a pair, huh? Brother, and I'll also add sister, we can't quit until we get our share. These words could very well encapsulate Dr. Holly's resolve in the face of adversity, his refusal to be silenced, and his unwavering commitment to education and empowerment. These songs, with their deep roots in the struggle for freedom and equality, 
complement the narrative of Dr. Holly's life, a narrative defined by unsinkable resilience and an enduring belief in the power of education to change lives. As we honor Dr. Holly, we reflect on the significance of his contributions and the continued relevance of his vision. The melodies of resilience and pride in our heritage remind us of the journey we have undertaken as a community. They inspire us to carry forward Dr. Holly's legacy of resilience, to uphold the values he championed, and to continue the work of lifting every voice, standing proud, and pushing towards a future where every individual can achieve their full potential. Thank you. Thank you for those reflections, Ms. Willis. Um, April 3rd was actually Dr. Holly's birthday, and he would have been 150 years old. And so our students, um, thanks to the Department of Student Affairs, actually threw a big birthday bash. So it is a blessing that our students are carrying the legacy of our great founder. And so we thank you, Dr. Lindsay, and the Department of Student Affairs for actually hosting that bash uh, on his actual birthday, which was April 3rd. We now will have the introduction of our guest speaker by Kayla Brenham, the Vice President of Student Government Association. So now, welcome to the podium, our Student Government Association Vice President. Thank you. Brenham. I think I said her name wrong, Brenham. Good morning, Rams. How is everyone? Greetings, I am Kayla Monique Burnham. I currently serve as the Vice President here at the Unsinkable and Indestructible Albany State University, and I will be introducing our speaker, Ms. Shirley miller Sherrod. Ms. Shirley miller Sherrod is a national civil rights figure, advocate, and global thought leader in agriculture policy and its impact on black farmers and the black community. She currently sits on the Biden administration's USDA Equity Commission, studying systemic racism within the department. A daughter of the Jim Crow South, she came to her, wa her work honest honestly at age 17. She witnessed an all-white grand jury refuse to indict a white farmer who took the life of her father and his own pasture in a dispute over livestock. After the murder, she vowed to commit her life in defending the rights of black living in her native Baker County, Georgia. That same year, Ms. Sherrod helped co-found the Southwest Georgia Project for Community Education with civil rights leader and late husband, Reverend Charles Sherrod. Today, together they fought to ensure equal access to the polls, to a quality education, and to farm their own land. Despite losing the property 15 years later, Due to drought and discriminatory government loan practices, Ms. Sherrod remained undaunted. She spent the next 25 years helping organize underserved farmers, including as Georgia State Field Director for the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. In 2009, the Obama White House nominated Ms. Sherrod to serve as the first black Georgia Director of Rural Development for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. She was forced to resign a year later after a conservative blogger edited a speech to appear she was prejudiced against white farmers. After the deception unraveled and despite apologies and another job offer from the administration, Ms. Sherrod opted to return home to resume her work with underserved farmers. Today, new communities at Cypress Pond or Resora, as it's known, serves as headquarters to the Sherrod Institute and its affiliates. The Southwest Georgia Project New Communities Land Trust and the Charles Sherrod Community Development Cooperation. Other affiliates include the Table of Southwest Georgia and WTU 88.3 FM. Together with Ms. Sherrod serving at the helm, these divisions carry out the near 60-year-old mission to move black farmers toward education, access, and economic independence. Ms. Sherrod was educated at Fort Valley State University and Albany State University where she earned her bachelor's degree. She holds a master's degree from Antioch University and is a 1993 Kellogg Fellow. Recently widowed, she is the mother of two adult children and the five grandchildren. Please welcome Ms. Shirley miller Sherrod to the stage. Good morning. You know, 
when I was growing up, I had an uncle who said, getting old ain't bad, it's just so, he put another word in there, inconvenient. <laughs> I didn't understand what he meant then, but I certainly understand today. To President Frederick, Vice President Melton, faculty, students, alums of this great school, my alma mater. It is truly great to be with you today. You know, when I was asked to speak, you didn't know that my family had a connection to Albany State um, and to Dr. Holly. Dr. Holly was a good friend of my grandparents and would often stay at the farm with them. He often traveled there to, to network and, you know, and this was as he was building what has become Albany State University. Now, my grandfather, according to the census, I knew him, but I didn't, you know, I was, I was the daughter of a younger, the youngest child, because they had a lot of children. Um, so I didn't know. He seemed to be well-educated to me, but according to the census, he only had a fifth grade education. But he knew the value of getting an education and the value of buying land. So it's no surprise that he would connect with someone like Dr. Holly, who was trying to build institutions for black people. And I grew up in, in, a, in a community called Hawkinstown. My grandmother's maiden name was Hawkins. And, you know, I don't know when they arrived in Baker County, but I do know that they worked together as family to buy hundreds of acres of land. And even today, it's called Hawkinstown. So back in those days in the rural areas, people went to church and uh, to school in churches. But my grandparents, there were 10 boys and four girls. Um, my grandfather was adamant that his children would be educated. So he bought a brand new car. And they initially went to school in Camilla, and then later here to Albany, to Albany State. It wasn't Albany State then. Y'all know the names from the earlier years. But um, there was a time when Things, it didn't appear that Albany State would make it. There were, there were problems. My grandfather, who had several farms, um, had a cane grinding meal um, and syrup making meal. I can remember all of that. He actually hauled uh, meat from the farm, killing hogs and other animals to help feed the students here at Albany State so that that Dr. Holly's dream could be fulfilled. I know that's not in Albany State's history, but we have heard it time after time uh, during our family reunions. You know, I had uncles who went to school here, and two of them, one especially, talked about, um, you know, he said, you know, we paid tuition, but we had to work, Papa, 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 as they called my grandfather, insisted that we work on the campus. So there was one, um, one of his sons who worked in the, in the uh, dining hall. And another one, he, oh my gosh, he talked about, I can't remember the name of the building. We lost it in the flood of 90th floor, but the seats were bolted to the floor. Yes. And Uncle Harrison, oh, he talked about how he had to get down on his knees cleaning that floor over and over again. You know, I have been, so you know, you can see Albany State, my connection to this school is real. And it was, it was there even before I was born. So you might say it's in my DNA. <laughs> I've been fortunate to experience, uh, have experiences with at least three HBCUs. Um, I traveled, as I traveled, to try to get an education beyond what was provided in Baker County. 
You know, it wasn't easy. My father was murdered right at the time I was graduating from high school. And because he was the breadwinner and the farm was our means of support, I didn't know once um, I graduated whether or not I would be able to go to college. My father was killed. He died on March 25th, 1965. I graduated on June 6th, 1965. Now, there was a little thing going on there before my father's murder. He, you know, there were all of us girls. There were five girls. He, they kept having babies trying to get a son. And every time it was another boy, I mean, another girl. So during my senior year, my mother kept getting sick. I didn't know what was wrong. And one day at school, my best friend asked me, how is your mom? I said, she doesn't seem to be getting any better. She said, girl, your daddy was at the store yesterday giving out cigars. Your mama's going to have a baby. <laughs> he had convinced my mother to try just one more time for this boy. So he told everyone, this is the boy. This, you know, he, he was having a new home built in a special room with five girls. He's have, he was having a special room for the boy. You know, it had to be painted blue. He had to have new furniture and everything. My father didn't live to, to um, see my brother's birth. He was born on June 6th, the day I graduated from high school. Um, my brother, my father was telling, you know, we didn't have football in Baker County. We, we did have basketball. Uh, but he kept telling about everybody, I want him to play, I want him to play sports. I want to, you know, my son is going to do this. My, he's just making all these plans. So my brother did get a chance to actually play football because Mitchell and Baker County merged uh, for the school system. And uh, he ended up getting a scholarship here to Albany State. Now that year they became champs. And my brother, y'all, did exactly what my father did. My father came here for one year, and there was that little girl back down there in Baker County that he couldn't stay away from. And believe it or not, my brother did the same thing. You know, he later came back and got his undergraduate degree and graduate degree from Albany State. Um, so my second HBCU, well, my first was going to Clark College that summer in a, in a pilot upward bound program. And that program became a major program for our, our, um, our children, our, our, for black people especially. Um, and my second experience, I, my, one of my uncles who was a vocational ag teacher over in Calhoun County, a big Fort Valley State supporter, just loaded me into the car and took me to Fort Valley. So that's how I ended up at Fort Valley. But two weeks after arriving there, I got a call saying white men had burned a cross at our home. In the house was my mother, my four sisters, and three-month-old brother. So it was difficult for me. I, I did the two years there, but then I transferred. I also married Charles Sherrod, who came into Baker County with other SNCC people during the summer of 1965 to help us in our fight for justice. And you should know that on the, I had no intention of living my life in the South, definitely not in Baker County. But once my father was murdered, I made the commitment on the night of his death to stay in the South and devote my life to working for change. Um, I was 17 years old, didn't know how I would do that. But once the people from SNCC, Charles Sherrod and others from SNCC, came in to, and, and, and let me say what SNCC is. You know, I was here talking to a group of students about a month ago, and I asked them, uh, how many of you have heard of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee? And not one of them raised their hand. Now, y'all, we got to do a little bit better here. You know, Albany played a major role in the civil rights movement. And it's just unthinkable that our young people who are standing on the shoulders of people who had so much to lose don't know that history. 
we've got to do a better job of educating them. So I took time that morning. I wasn't there to talk about SNCC, but I took the time to give them a short lesson on the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, Charles Sherrod, and the work that was started here in this region by him. So, you know, I couldn't, before my father's murder, I couldn't see any beauty where I lived. I couldn't see the accomplishments of my family coming out of slavery to become landowners. I couldn't appreciate the fact that under extraordinary circumstances, including not being far removed from slavery, they understood the power in land ownership and became landowners. I could not see that with all of the racism and Jim Crow laws, Jim Crow laws rather, I had family who cared, neighbors who cared, and, and teachers who cared. Unlike Dr. Joseph Holly, I did not see the possibilities in and for our people. At the time, I didn't understand that we had all of the ingredients necessary to build a better life, not only for me, but for Southwest Georgia. You know, I'm reminded of a situation I was in. I um, applied for a, K a Kellogg Fellowship, just on a whim, and was su surprised to go through all of their process and finally get uh, selected as one of 50 that they chose that year. Well, I didn't know what I was in for. You know, this was, it was a three-year fellowship. It was an amazing opportunity to travel all over this world. And, and anywhere I thought that I could go, go and, and learn more and become a better leader, they made the money available for me to do that. So one of the first things they did is they took us out to Leadville, Colorado, to go through these exercises to help us become better leaders. The first morning after getting there, they woke, we had to be up at like three in the morning so we could eat and then go out to this place where there was a rock. We had to do rock climbing. Well, I had never done that, never even <laughs> thought that I would be doing something like that. And this rock was about 10 stories high. And I looked at the age of the, the, the 50 individuals, and there were two of us in our late 40s. Everybody else was young. They were leaders already in their fields, you know, all these doctors and lawyers and so forth. So I sat there for a little bit, and I watched them strap up and just go right up that rock. And knowing me, I decided if I sit here and try to wait till the end, I'll never be able to do it. So I decided, okay, I got to jump out here and do this. So they strapped me up, and um, I started up the rock. I was about halfway when I couldn't see anywhere else I could grab to hold on or put my feet so that I wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't fall. And so I, I, I started begging them, just pull me up. Please just pull me up. And they were encouraging me to keep trying. And then I sat there and had a few choice things to say to myself. You know, you're always getting in stuff. You know, this was something you didn't have to do. <laughs> so finally, finally, I decided they are not pulling me up. And if I get off this rock, I'm going to have to do it myself. So then I started looking to my side, left to right. And I saw that I could move left, and there was a place where I could grab the rock and place my feet and keep going up the rock. I made it, y'all. You know. <laughs> now, I won't tell you what happened when they told me, they started talking about repelling. I'm going to go back down that rock from up there. Oh, no. That, I just, I won't go into that, but uh, at any rate, I learned some valuable lessons that day, you know, and I'm sure as, as, as Dr. Holly worked to create a school, he had many days where there were lessons he had to learn. 
In spite of the obstacles, Dr. Holly kept working toward his vision. Just think of his struggle to develop a black educational institution that would eventually, eventually become part of the university system of Georgia and the struggle he had just to keep the doors open. As someone who has been part of the struggle to attempt to build systems and institutions that benefit our people and show the power in working together, one can only imagine the barriers Dr. Holly had to deal with, not just from the outside, but from within. Some of our worst problems can come from our own people, you know, and you just have to suck it up and keep going and hope that one day their eyes will open. If he were present today, he would see a university that started as a Bible and manual training institute, later renamed as Georgia Normal and Agricultural College, and now a university offering 35 undergraduate degrees and graduate programs in mul multiple academic areas. Dr. Holly's persistence paid off for us. Sometimes as we look for a pie in the sky or someone to magically save us, we fail to recognize and appreciate the solid foundation that we are standing on. Dr. Holly had a dream and didn't give up on it. The road is never easy, nor is there a blueprint or roadmap to your destination. But if you make the commitment and stay the course, you will find that the elusive pie in the sky is actually within reach because it is within your community if you make it so. I am sure Dr. Holly saw the need as well as the potential within his own community and set about the task of recruiting, organizing, and helping others to see, develop, and, produce, and pursue a common vision. That vision included, included providing black Georgians with access to education, and thus now Albany State, an institution whose impact is felt far beyond what Dr. Holly envisioned. Do not misunderstand me. I am not a Dr. Joseph Holly, and I am not trying to equate my meager accomplishments to his. But like him, I chose to stay in my community to help make a positive difference. And because of him, I have some of the tools necessary to accomplish that goal. I thought I could only make a name for myself if I went away. I'm here to tell you that we need, Southwest Georgia needs, all we can do to bring improvements here in this area. You know, I worry all the time about the brain drain. And I understand young people thinking, oh, I got to get away from here. You know, I can't, I can't do anything here. People here are too backward. People here don't listen. You know, there's no way I can make a difference here. But we can do it. We just need to open our eyes and decide to work together for a better Southwest Georgia. You know, I got in trouble nearly 14 years ago when I talked about the first white farmer I assisted who was having problems with Farmers Home Administration and therefore was about to lose his land. In fact, I was fired by Secretary Vilsack and literally thrown under the bus by the Obama administration. There were many who condemned me, and that includes the NAACP. It didn't matter that my husband, Charles Sherrod, and I had spent years in the civil rights movement. That whole incident is an example of doing the right thing and standing up for what is right, even when the odds and what seemed like the whole world is against you. I can tell you it hurt, but I couldn't dwell on that hurt. You know, I had to... I, I, I had to keep moving um, because there were people who knew me well, people I had networked throughout the country uh, who knew immediately that the things being said about me were not true. But there were so many who heard that and thought I was this terrible person. 
You know, I'm a person of faith, and I've spent my life working for changes needed, whether that was assisting black or white people. And I have a God that can handle things better than you could ever dream of doing. You know. Who came to my rescue? The white farmer and his whole family. He died a couple of years ago, just before turning 100. But I can tell you, I felt as close to him as to my grandfather. We didn't ever end a phone conversation without saying, I love you, to each other. Now, if you had told me that, if you had told me that I would get that close to a white person, especially here in Southwest Georgia, I would have said, no way. But look at what God did. Southwest Georgia's history is not viewed as one of the best in the state, but those of us who live, work, and love Southwest Georgia know that that view of us is not a true description of who we are. We do not have the best record of working together, but we know that change, that that can change. And I'm urging leaders and residents of Southwest Georgia to make a commitment to embrace the beauty of the area the beauty of the people, and the great assets God has given us, and make a decision to work together to become the friends and neighbors we need to be to make changes that benefit, benefit all and not just a few. I remember a conversation with Ambassador Andrew Young. He told me about how people from the business world in all sections of Atlanta came together and they plotted the changes that happened to help make Atlanta what it is today. It is my dream that we will do that. You can't beat the value of networking to learn and grow together. When I was targeted by racists and thrown under the bus by the Obama administration, I'm sure the White House and Department of Agriculture started wondering the next day, who is this woman? You know, they started getting calls from all over the country and emails from Native Americans, Hispanics, white. You know, I had networked. They didn't know I had spent all of those years not just working with black farmers here in the South, but with farmers and other rural residents throughout this country. You know, I heard from folks I hadn't heard from in years. I want to make one last point. There is power in forgiving and moving forward. You know. Secretary Vilsack apologized to me nearly 14 years ago, and I accepted that apology and told him at the time that we had to work, we had work to do. I did not hesitate one second when I was appointed by the Biden administration to serve on the Equity Commission. President Biden signed an executive order in January 2021 on advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities, underserved communities through the federal government and committed to creating an equity commission as part of his rural agenda and commitment to closing the racial wealth gap by addressing longstanding inequities in agriculture. And y'all, there are so, so many going back to the creation of the Department of Agriculture. After two years of working with others who were appointed as members of the Equity Commission or subcommittee members on agriculture and rural development, we, pre we presented a report to Secretary Vilsack on tw February 22nd with 66 recommendations for change. We are now having equity summits in different places in the country. I was in Detroit last week for one that was held in Dearborn. Many of the members of the Equity Commission and members of the Department of Agriculture, and I hope it's not too soon for me to announce, but including Vilsack himself, is gonna attend the Equity Summit being held here and will be at Resora on May 16.
I'm excited for him to come, but I'm even more excited for this little woman that y'all are going to see. She's the, she's the uh, acting assistant secretary for civil rights, Dr. Penny Brown Reynolds. She is a firebrand. Oh, my goodness. And she's making so many changes in the Office of Civil Rights at uh, USDA. As I close, I want to say that I grew up in a community and family that instilled in me the value of learning, sharing, and reaching back to help someone else. Those were also the lessons of my parents, Grace and Hosey Miller. I want to ask you to follow Dr. Holly's example of working to build a better life in Southwest Georgia and bring back the desire to build a to promote a life of service, I'm sorry, and a life where you do for others. Remember, we make our living by what we get, but we make our life by what we give. Here's hoping that as a proud alum of Albany State University, I've lived by the example and kept alive hope and love. Thank you. Why y'all standing? We can do better than that. Let's give her a nice round of applause. Thank you. You may be seated. At this time, we'll have another selection from the Albany Freedom Singers and the ASU Chorale.
is so creative. Let's give him another hand, please. So at this time, it gives me great pleasure to bring up my boss and the illustrious 10th president of Albany State University, Dr. Marion Ross Frederick. Please give her a hand. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, y'all awake this morning. So I want to take a, just a couple of moments to just acknowledge some folks in the room. I'm going to start with Chairman Hurd and Mayor Baldura. Just want to tell you all thank you. Can y'all stand up and can you see them? Always supporting ASU. We also have the rest of the Holly family or other Holly family members. Can you all stand up as well? Thank you all for joining us this morning. I am going to call out just a couple of our student groups, and I know this is dangerous because I'm going to miss some of you, um, but my wonderful, beautiful Holly ambassadors, handsome Holly ambassadors, are y'all in the room? There, yeah, stand up. There you go. We have some back here. They are forever, forever representing ASU, and I am so thankful for them being on the team and an extension of the Office of the President. So thank you all as well. We also have a backup choir in the room. It's called our football team. Can y'all stand up? Stand up, say. stand up, gentlemen, and say good morning. Stand up, stand up. <laughs> they, they, <laughs> don't sing. They bring a whole level of energy in the room um, with the clapping and the singing and, and the sleeping. But thank you all for being here as, as well. <laughs> Do we have other student groups that I'm not seeing in the room? Other, other than our royal court, they are in the room as well. I know they've been acknowledged, but they are looking forward to their last event on tomorrow. Um, but they have been a wonderful, outstanding role court, so welcome to all of those. Is that the University College in the back? Tell me who it is. Soccer team. There you Stand up, please. Our soccer team. I didn't see Coach. Please stand up. Our concert chorale, will y'all stand up as well, please? I know y'all have already been up singing and beautifully. And all other students that I have not called, please stand up. All of our students, the volleyball teams in the back. Our alumni in the group, please stand. Say hello. Y 
I noticed that beautiful blue as well. Um, faculty and staff, please stand up. Say hello. And I'm going to ask my husband to stand up as well, just to say hello. Is Mr. Fedrick, can you stand up, please? <laughs> they all chuckle because they're like, no. <laughs> Thank you. Y'all, I asked you all to stand up, um, number one, because I want to tell you I honor you um, and all that you do for this wonderful, wonderful university. We would not be here standing on the shoulders that we stand on without all of you being at the table with us. So I got to tell you all, thank you. Give yourselves another round of applause. Your contributions, your dedication, your commitment, it absolutely makes a difference to what we do each and every day. And as I look this way, I notice that I missed the National Alumni Association. Y'all please stand. I know they thought they would get out of it, but where is Dr. Thomas? And please stand. And do we have our board members, our um, foundation board members in the room? Mr. Holly, there you go. Please stand. When you see some of the same alumni, same, same board members, same National Alumni Association members, they will always be on our stage. They will always help us to get done what we need to get done. Um, they are the pillar behind what goes on. You all may not see them, but they are working hard. We have literally the hardest working alumni and boards in the University System of Georgia. So thank you all for supporting us. I want to say to Ms. Shirley Sherrod, thank you so much. The history of what she brings is phenomenal. Thank you. I had the pleasure of, and you can get that from me, I had the pleasure of having the Board of Regents here a couple of years ago. Um, and we actually had an event out at Resora, and Ms. Sherrod had the, uh, had the wonderful acumen to actually speak to them and tell them about the history of Georgia. So with all of the Board of Regents and all of the presidents of the university system, she held court with those folks. Um, and they walked away with the knowledge that they did not have of Southwest Georgia. So thank you so much for that. And on behalf <laughs> And close to wrapping up, as we celebrate our uh, founding, we also want to honor our faculty and staff and employees, three of whom have reached 25 years of service to the institution. And I'm gonna ask them to come to the stage as I call their name. These employees have given more than a quarter of a century to the work of higher education in many different ways. And some of them are actually alumni. So they went to school here and they came back uh, to teach and to lead. And some of them were athletes as well. But I wanna to bring to the stage Coach Dan Land, 25 years. Coach Land here? I would make a joke, but I'm not going to do that. Um, but, but tell <laughs> oh, That's so funny. Yeah, so I won't. Um, Irma Relaford, Veterans Coordinator, Office of the Registrar. Our next is Ms. Loretta Harris, Lead Accountant, Office of Physical Affairs. So thank you for your service and for all that you do for Albany State University. Um, next, we have a couple of events that should be in your book. Please join us as we do the graveside service as well. 
And I think VP Melton will come and tell you about a wonderful, wonderful event that we're going to have tomorrow honoring some outstanding people in the Albany community and, and beyond, all of which are ASU alum. Thank you and welcome to Founders Week. As the president has just mentioned that we will be having a grave site service immediately following this event, so we invite you to join us um, at the um, grave site of Dr. Holly. Um, so please join us for that as well. And also we have a couple of alumni events that are taking place today. One in particular is the alumni luncheon. So I'm gonna have to look to Dr. Thomas and Mrs. Goff to, are there any more tickets available? Or are you all sold out? You sold out? Okay, well, you're so, we were sold out. So, but they will be having the alumni luncheon today as well. Uh, and also the business meeting, the alumni business meeting. Um, as the president has said, we have an event tomorrow night where we'll be honoring some great um, alums um, at our, our gala, our 2024 Blue and uh, Gold Scholarship Gala. However, we are sold out as well, too. So <laughs> I know you're happy to hit up, Mr. Holly. So we don't have any tickets available, but we solicit your support and your prayers as we honor and celebrate tomorrow evening and raise awareness of the institution and philanthropic dollars for our students. The purpose of that event is to raise money uh, for these deserving students that you see in here today so that we can provide more scholarships. So thank you if you have supported. Now, you don't have to come to the event, but you can leave a check at this event, and Crystal um, is somewhere in the room. I just don't see her at the moment, but where is she at? Cause she's at the gravesite. She's working, but uh, we we taking checks today at the gravesite and all week, so if, if you're not coming to any of the events, we please um, consider giving to the institution. Um, so at this time, we would like to thank you for sharing in this moment with us today. Um, and we will now close with our alma mater. So I'm going to ask you all to please stand. And who's gonna lead that? Who's gonna lead it? Yeah, come on, lead it. I, don't, I can't lead it. Did I, I didn't miss it? Oh!